Welcome to Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate, the number one podcast dedicated to helping you get comfortable in the commercial real estate arena and equipping you with the latest market news, insights, and strategies you need to make informed decisions about investing. Now, let's get into today's episode with your host, Angel and Brittany Gonzalez. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again on Taking a Leap in a Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Angel Gonzalez. I got my co-host, Brittany Gonzalez, here with us today. Well, we actually really honored because we've been uh, trying to navigate a way to get our uh, amigo here on this uh, podcast, uh, Steve Werner here, who uh, I'm happy to have on and really get an opportunity to get to know his background. So I'm right off the bat going to ask you, Steve, can you just uh, introduce yourself and tell us what it is that you do? Sure. Um, my name is Steve Warner. I am the Chief Revenue Officer for Home Invest, um, but I do a lot more than just revenue. Uh, my background is in sales and marketing and specifically events. So I brought all of that expertise to Home Invest. Uh, I've been partnered with Nate Armstrong. He's the CEO and founder. Uh, we've been partnered together now for several years. Um, we've got, we're at about 50 million, a uh, little, little shy of 50 million assets under management. Uh, most of that done through live events and personal relationships. So happy to talk through that a little bit. So Steve, I'm going to just make you expand a little bit more. So you did very, very high level about everything that you do. So just take it one level a little bit deeper, go a little sure. bit um, deeper into the events that you do. Just how do you create and collaborate those thing, uh, partnerships? Because you said you pretty much do everything by who you know, right? It's relationship it's everything so you've compounded a very lot in that little introduction so go a little bit deeper no problem the <laughs> i mean i'll give you the i'll give you the 30 second overview of my life i guess i was lucky um i started with real estate when i was in college i read rich dad poor dad uh when i it was 2001 it was right after 9 11 and i read rich dad poor dad i was in school to be an art teacher um i i don't know i'm very creative you guys will learn i like uh, ideas a lot anyway uh, Red Rich at Port Ad, and the same week I got fired from my job waiting tables. Um, I wasn't necessarily the best employee. And so I went out and I started looking at properties right away, right? I was like, I'm going to do this. Well, the first realtor ended up firing me because he said, you know, he was like, so let me get this straight. You don't have a job. You don't have any savings. You're in college. Do you have a, do you have a proof of funds letter? And I was like, well, what is that? And he was like, you have to go to the bank. So I thought, well, I'll go to the bank and I'll tell them I'm going to buy investment real estate. It throws off capital. You know, I'm a young 22 year old kid. I'm like, of course they'll give me a loan. Well, of course they did not give me a loan. They laughed <laughs> me out of the room. The, uh, several months went by. I kept reading books. I kept trying to meet with people. Uh, eventually I asked my landlord, my landlord was very old school and he made us write a check. So like, I still have a checkbook on my desk. I still Whoa. use paper checks, right? It's rare. Um, he made us write paper checks. You had to pay him in person because he didn't buy the check is in the mail thing. Um, he was writing to a bunch of college kids. That was one of the rules when you moved in. You hand me a check on the first through the third. And he had, that was it. So anyway, I wrote him a check one month and I said, hey, I'm trying to figure out this how to be a landlord thing. Can I take you to breakfast? And that started me and Bob going to breakfast once or twice a month uh, talking about real estate. He actually ended up uh, selling me my first building. And instead of buying a duplex, I bought a eight unit commercial building, eight residential units, two commercial units and 12 storage units. Um, wow. The building that I lived in. He said, why don't I just sell it to you? He was in his early 80s and he had owned the building free and clear. And we ended up doing creative financing. I didn't even know it was creative financing. He, wow. he was just like, we can figure this all out. I bought that. Long story short, between 2001 and 2005, I had uh, about 40 properties, a little under 40 properties for about 135 units as a college kid. What? But I did it all wrong. Impressive. <laughs> well, it oh, is boy. tons of action, right? Um, this is why Hunter and I get along so well. Like I am like action, action, action. Let's go. I was the landlord. I was the plumber. I was the electrician. I was the roofer. I was the drywaller. And I'm in college. Um, I got really burned out. I did things. I, I structured things wrong. I made like every mistake you could make, but I just kept pushing forward. 
So 2005 came around and um, I had a section eight building where I had a tenant go sideways and create all kinds of headaches. And I just, I saw like what was kind of coming around the corner. So I sold everything, um, made some cash. And then I went and traveled for two and a half years. Uh, when I woke up, um, I was bartending in Chicago and then uh, ended up working for Vail Resorts. I know we've talked about Vail a little bit. Um, oh, I was yeah. in corporate management for Vail. Um, I lived in Vail. And then I woke up one one day, I went to Tony Robbins uh, in 2012. And Tony, if you guys have ever been to a Tony event, have you guys been there? I think we talked about this, didn't we? I, I have not. Our partner has, and it's all about the Tony life. And so that's why yeah. he, he's actually trying to get us to get into a couple of things of, of Tony's now. So Okay, you got to go. That's that's what I will say. So the, the, he asked you a question, and one of the one entire day is spent on, is your life going how you want it to go right now? If you continue leading that life, where will you be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? Or if you want to, if you have a vision of where you want to go, how do you get there? What does the next three years look like? No, it's the next five years look like. What's the next 10 years look like? It's crazy. I went in 2000, it was the end of 2012. So I answered the question, no, like I didn't plan on being in corporate restaurant management. I was, I mean, uh, on paper, I owned a couple million dollars in property by the time I was 23. Like, what am I doing here? And I was like, if I continue on this path, I'm making a hundred grand a year, but I'm pretty much capped. This is not what I want to do. And I know the point of this is real estate. So I'll bring it back to real estate. The Oh, no, man. We, 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 I like where you're going, man. You keep it going. It's I, I Basically, I was like, okay, if I really want to live a different life, then I have to take different actions. So ask me the tattoo story later. We'll, we'll bring that up later because there's not time for it now. But the I left that event. I went back, and we were going into the 2012-2013 season in Colorado. And I told my manager that that was going to be my last season. Um at the time, I had several hundred employees under me. Um, I said, I'll give you one season, but I'm going to leave at the end of the season. And he tried to talk me out of it. I still left at the end of the season. And at the time, I said, I want to, I'm really good at speaking. I'm really good at public speaking. I'm really good at motivation. I'm really good at like helping break through people's beliefs. And I didn't even know the stuff that I know now. But I was like, I want to, I want to hold events. So I went all in on events. I left. I moved to Las Vegas. Uh, I held my first event at Treasure Island. I sold a total of two tickets, had to refund everybody, um, lost my entire 401k. I cashed out my 401k to hold the event, um, lost all of it. But then my second event, I learned a lot from my first event. My second event, we had 80 people in the room. Uh, we did about 25k in sales. Uh, third event, we had 80 people, but we did over 100k in sales. Um, and I just kept pumping out these small events. I learned that Vegas wasn't the best place to hold events. I learned a lot about public speaking, learned about a lot about sales from stage. Um, by 2015, we were doing six to 10 events a year uh, with top line sales of anywhere between like three and 5 million. Wow. The I was not in real estate though. Um, I started looking at real estate. I got involved, um, got involved in a project in Vegas got involved in a project uh, in Colorado and did okay with them. But then some of my clients started hiring me to hold events for them because I, I earned a name in that space. A couple of them were in the real estate space, uh, whether it was real estate training or real estate fundraising. And so we started doing those events. And by 2019, about somewhere around half of my clients, a little less than half, were in the real estate space. So I was holding, I helped one person who was doing uh, single family fix and flips. I helped somebody who was doing wholesale specific. I helped somebody who was doing multifamily training. And I helped, I had four clients, I think, that we were doing multifamily fundraising for. Um, and then from that, I ended up working with Nate, who is now my partner. Uh, Nate and I really, really just meshed really well together. He has great corporate values, uh, really, really good guy. I really liked how his programs were built. Um, I liked the values that they were founded on. And uh, he ended up, we had a couple different conversations around how to, how do you make this your full-time thing? And I it kept coming back to, well, I need, I need some equity in the deals. Um, 
I want to actually do some of the fundraising. I need to be in the GP, those kind of conversations. Um, but we came to an agreement and now, so now we do for home invest specifically, uh, this is the full circle story. We do a three day event every month. We do a one day event every month. Uh, we do somewhere between 15 and 20 webinars, which are one to three hours all around multifamily real estate. Um, so we educate, we nurture, we bring in our investors through there. Um, I mean, last year we raised, last year we raised a little over 30 million. Um, this year, our goal, we are on track right now to, to break a hundred. Um, and that's all through events and public speaking. So we do public speaking out in the world. Uh, we train one of the unique niches. Uh, we teach high schoolers financial literacy, um, which works really well. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from them, which actually leads to their parents coming into our circle. Um, we speak on a lot of local stages, a lot of fundraisers, uh, anywhere we can get on stage and we can provide value. It's always value first, right? It's not just us up there hawking your deals. It's us providing value and talking about financial freedom and how to build a stable base for your family in today's world, uh, which is sorely needed. So that's the full circle. I, I got to tell you, man, it, it's, it, it is definitely a full circle, but when you think about like speaking and, and, and being like, you, not everybody thinks, okay, you know what? I'm going to go from everything I've been doing up to this point. I'm just going to jump on stage and start speaking in front of people and, and make it meaningful. So like, take me through that, like feeling emotion. Like what, what do you think gave you that? Like, okay, I can do this. And like, and what do you think was the, the, the milestone or the thing that made you finally be, kind of break through with that space. When I was a young kid, um, there's a picture I have. It's actually in the other room that I keep with me. I was in first grade and I narrated our school play. In first grade? In first grade. I can't tell you, like, I didn't have like this big dream of me on stage. Uh, but then in 2003, I went to um, the learning annex. It was Donald Trump and Robert Kiyosaki. And okay. I remember seeing them on stage, but more importantly, I saw this guy named Marshall Silver. And not that Marshall has anything. I wouldn't go look him up. He's not worth watching. But I saw him. Literally, he what it was, so Learning Annex was a pitch fest. Everybody paid for 30 minutes on stage, or you got a little breakout room, and they would sell things, right? This guy named Marshall Silver, his room wasn't available. So he literally jumped on a table in the middle of the auditorium, and probably got 200 people around him. And he motivated people, first off. He provided some value. And then he actually gave people a discounted ticket to his live event. I went to his live event. At the time, I didn't know this, but it was a value ladder, right? Free to low ticket to high ticket. So I went to his live event. His live event was in Chicago. Um, I had to get on a plane. I had to rent a hotel room all of the things go to this event where he pitched, he pitched a 50 K and 150 K coaching program. I didn't buy either of those, but then he downsold everybody into a 10 K, which I did buy that whole thing stuck with me. And then when I went to Tony Robbins, I was like, you know, I love, I love motivating people. When I was, when I was doing my thing in college, I spoke a lot in college, not to not like being on stages, not as a paid keynote, but I would just speak to college kids about like, you don't have to be a cog in the system. You can actually go build a business. You can do something. I was an art major. I mean, I had a 2.1 GPA. The fact that I can go out and, and I can build something. I loved, I took three business classes and all of them, uh, one of them specifically, the teacher was like speaking some nonsense on screen and like drawing out like big, crazy theorems. And I just raised my hand and I said, I don't think any of that's real. And he was like, well, we ended up talking. He said, well, what do you really know about business? And I said, well, right now I've got over $3 million in properties. I have three commercial businesses. Um, I owned a clothing store, which was another side project and a cleaning company. And I was like, all of them make money. And he like, he sat there and he's like, well, what do you mean make money? And I said, well, last month we collected over a hundred thousand dollars in cash. And that was, that was like the, like that silence right there was like the uncomfortable silence in the room. Cause all the <laughs> kids are like looking at me and I was, I was a cocky 20, 22 or 23 year old. Right. 
they're all looking at me and the teacher doesn't know what to say because the teacher was probably making 40 grand. Do a business, you don't need you don't need an 80 page business plan. You need one page, a clear goal, and you need to go sell. That's the first thing. So all of this coming back to speaking, what made me think that I could do it? Nothing other than blind faith. Tony Robbins said that I could. I believed. Well, the question though, the real question is, do you, it goes back to the question, do you want a different life than where your life is headed right now? You guys had that same question when you stepped into real estate, right? I don't care whether you're a corporate person making 250K a year or if you're a waiter or a bartender making 40K a year. If you want a different outcome 10 years from now, you have to be willing to do something different. And the other thing that, I mean, Ray Dalio talks about it in the most complicated way possible, but the the simple way is there's, it's not straight line. It's not, I am going to go get on stage tomorrow and I'm going to sell a million dollars and I'm going to have this phenomenal career. I was talking to another kid at one of the um, speaking engagements we did where we were training kids and you ask them, what do you guys think you're going to do? They all think they're going to be millionaire influencers. Like literally... I asked them to raise their hand. How many of you guys think you're going to be a millionaire influencer like Mr. Beast? 90% of the room. I said, how many of you are producing videos today? About a third of the room. I said, how many of you have produced more than 200 videos? Two kids. I said, "If you, it's consistent action leading to the path that you want to go. I'm not going to tell you you can't be a millionaire influencer. I believe that you can. But are you going to put in the reps? It's not an easy straight line process. What Ray Dalio shows is it's like you take a step, you're going to mess up. You're going to get punched in the face. You're going to learn what not to do wrong. Then you're going to take that step again. You're going to get punched in the face a different way that you never saw coming. Then you're going to figure out how to, how to plan for that. Right. If I had the business that I have now, 10 years ago, I would have had no idea how to manage it. Right. People Another way I can state this, people ask me to put them on stage. Hey, get me on stage, get me on stage, get me on stage. We've all been to an event, right? Where there's a thousand people in the audience and there's somebody on stage that has no right being up on stage. Like they can't speak. They're all over the place. The audience is falling asleep. You guys are both cringing because we've all seen it, right? I hear it all the time. Hey, Steve, put me on one of your stages. I'll crush it. We're going to do so well. Have you spoke on stage before? No. Have you built slides before? No. Have you ever given a speech in front of a thousand people? Because I'll tell you, standing up on stage with a thousand people staring back at you, your mind goes blank real fast. And that's like, you have to build up to it. I know I'm way off topic and like kind of ranting, but. No, you actually are dead on. I know Brittany has got some growth coming, but I would tell you, man, like that actually, I really appreciate you touching on that because I think sometimes we forget. Um, when I think of like Michael Jordan, when I think of all the best of the best, Tony Robbins, I mean, when I think about some of the best of what they do, one of the things they always have in common is the fact that they put in the reps, they put in the time, they put in that energy and they fail. And a lot of times I feel like somehow that gets missed. And I think that schools actually do a disservice because they also do not let us, uh, I think they don't harness the fact that, Hey, guess what? You're going to go out there and you're going to botch it. They almost is like they're trying to make sure you don't feel like that's going to happen or something. And it's like, no, that's so. But well, we live in a nerfed society. This is man. Don't let your kids fail. Don't let the pain of failure drive success more than anything else. If you think about that, like it, when times when we're winning, we don't work harder. We work less, right? All oh, things are great. Money's coming in. Everything's going well. I'm going to go on vacation. You know what? I'm going to sleep in a couple extra hours. I'm going to, and there's nothing wrong with having times like that. There, there are periods in life, but pain, the person who can endure the most pain, the longest wins the biggest hundred percent. Because if you can put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, it forces growth. When I have a hundred thousand dollars in ads, we spend, we spend a hundred thousand to 150,000 a month in ads. When I started with Home Invest, we were spending about 30. Um, my biggest month in ad spend before that was probably 50. When you have that much ad spend going out, you there's a lot of dials you got to watch. There's a lot of pressure. And pressure either creates diamonds or creates cracks. 
most of the time, if you're willing to put yourself into it, I know you guys are successful because you probably operate very well under pressure. You teach yourself that I can work under pressure and that's what causes breakthroughs. The biggest breakthroughs I've ever had in life have come from pressure, but you have to be willing to submit to that. If you can't, you're not going to. And the schools today, oh, let me give you a participation ribbon. You showed up. Is that teaching anybody anything? No. Yeah, it makes you feel, it makes the kid feel good. It's, this is, have you guys heard the marshmallow uh, delayed gratification story? I'm not, not sure that with us. Oh, gosh. Okay. In the early 80s, there was a study done where they put a marshmallow in front of a kid in first grade. I believe it was first grade. It might have been kindergarten. And they said, if you can wait two minutes without touching the marshmallow, we will give you two marshmallows. 80% of the class couldn't do it. They tracked the kids that could wait. And they found that the kids that could force themselves to have delayed gratification did were in the top 5% across the board. This is a very paintbrush, like big brush picture of delayed gratification. So going back to that, in schools today, we're not teaching delayed gratification. We're not teaching hard work. We're teaching, oh, you're a special snowflake and... You know, you showed up today and I understand things are really hard for you. We all know people that came from hard backgrounds. I came from a lower middle class divorce family. Like I, my, I'm lucky. My parents love me. It wasn't a messy divorce, but my mom was a school teacher and my dad worked at a gas station. Like we didn't have a lot, but that drove me, right? I was out, I was out raking leaves, mowing yards and fixing gutters when I was 10. Like I think back to that story, my mom side story, but we went to the, the mall. Air Jordans had just came out in 1986. You guys remember the first Jordans, the black and red oh, ones? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So they were, they were $89 at the finish line. And I was like, I want those for school. And my mom was like, we don't have money for those. She said, I like, she was trying to be nice, right? Oh, well, if you got those, you wouldn't have money for jeans and shirts and blah, blah, blah. No, I want the Jordans. I'm throwing a tantrum, like level 10, nuclear tantrum in the middle of the mall. And my mom sat me down. This is a pain story. My mom sat me down and, and like, I remember the metal bench and like the crisscross, like feeling in my legs, like the metal pushing in. And she was like, if you want those shoes, then you need to go get a job. I went home and got the lawnmower and I made enough in two days to go buy them. Like wow. she thought I stole them. I rode my bike to the mall and I came back with them. And my mom was like, what, did you steal those? I said, no, I went like, you saw me dragging the lawnmower up and down the street. And she was like, you made a hundred dollars. So yeah. And honestly, like I, I tell that story on stage, but going back to that, like that's, that probably is what started it. By the time I was 10 or 11, I had four grand in cash. Like she found it in a shoebox under my bed. And she was like, what, like, where did you get all this mowing yards? Okay, by the way, that, I'm going to th I'm going to tell you right there, Steve, that that's a show off story because I had that same wish and want. I ended up with this thing called Jordash. <laughs> See, <laughs> dude, all the hot chicks wore Jordash. Come on. Oh, oh my god. I remember just being that kid that was like super like embarrassed cuz like my friends had Jordans, I had Jordash. I'm like, "Mom, there are, there's no C H E or whatever you want to call it on these shoes." Whenever I saw them on the, on the commercials. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I forgot the lawnmower part. Oh man. I had, just so you know, I had the, I had like the, the, we didn't have Walmart shoes at the time. They were like the Kmart brand lookalike wannabes. I mean, now all the kids can get away with wearing like Converse, right? Like Converse now are cool. If you were in Converse when we were in high school, that was like the, yeah, exactly. We're all shaking our head. We all know that kid that had Converse because they were 10 bucks. I was that kid. I just, the way that I got out of them, man, my mom's never heard this. I just took my scissors and cut holes in them. And then I said they fell apart. So like three pairs in, my mom was like, okay, we're going to get something better. That was in fourth grade. My fifth grade is the year that I bought the Jordans. Um, So that was like, and by seventh grade, like I had a stack of cash under my bed. If I wanted something, I went and bought it. Like, anyway, that's my story on like the participation ribbon, making people feel good. It's not about feeling good. If you can become comfortable, 
Alex Ramosi, I don't know if you guys know who that is, big, great influencer. One of the stories that he tells, which I agree with, is if you can tell yourself the story that being in pain right now is going to lead to greatness tomorrow and you can actually smile about the pain that you're in and become comfortable with it, you will win. That's what working out is. You go to the gym, you know those people that are in the gym and they're smiling ear to ear? That is not me. I do it. I tough it out. But the people that are like grinning ear to ear, they're the people who look the best because they find a way to make it fun. You're, I think you're so right, Steve. There's so many different things that you've just been able to, I say, share with the audience, audience educate them, um, just give them new perspectives. Um, I'm going to actually channel you back and kind of do a new full circle all the way around. So you were in college. You negotiated with your landlord to be able to uh, obtain a new property. Then you exited the real estate world, right, for a period of time, traveled the world. But then you came back into it. Was there a lesson that you would have told yourself when you were in your young infancy stage that you wish you would have learned to prepare you for where you are today? That's a great question. Um, there's two or three that I would give you. The first one is higher property management. Um, I I was dumb in the fact that I thought I'm just going to like, I, I was 22 and I was invincible, right? I, I was like, I'm just going to like Superman this and I'm going to flex and like I can do all of it. I don't need any sleep. I've got this little magic drug called Adderall and caffeine. Like I'm just going to push, right? And that worked for three years. If I would have, and I structured the deals wrong, like this is a little technical, it's not too too much. I structured the deals on 15-year fixed amateuriz amateurization schedules, and I took all the cash flow out because my thought was if I just really push for 15 years, by the time I'm 38, my goal, this is my goal, was to have half a million dollars a month in passive income by the time I was 38. And like I penciled it all out, right? I had like all the whiteboards and, but I was like, if I just, I need like 500 properties and I'll just freaking man up. A horrible way to look at it. Horrible way. Um, Gary Vanderchuk talks about, it's not, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? What are the small consistent actions that you can take every day? And if you, adding in Warren Buffett to that, if you make sure there's no downside, but a reasonable upside, you will win. Instead, I structured everything so there was this massive downside and a massive upside, but it was one or the other. There wasn't a moderate. So I woke up three years in with, you know, a hundred at three years in, I think I had a hundred, maybe 110 units. And my cash flow per month was like three to five grand. It was, yeah, it was horrible, right? But I was like, I, I bought, I, I made all the mistakes. I told you this. I bought some properties. I didn't buy anything that was negative cash flowing on paper. But then with two months vacancy, it was. Or when the roof went out or when the AC unit went out or something happened, that was suddenly a break even or slightly loser. Right? So I'm working a gazillion hours. I'm doing all the maintenance. I'm managing all the horrible properties and all the don't ever take section eight. That's one that I would throw out there. Section oh, eight is not be horrible. Um, they, they tempt you with that carrot. Oh, free rent. You're going oh, yeah, to get the river yeah. until you find out what they do to your property. <laughs> right. That's, <laughs> that's exactly it. Um, I had a tenant drag a railroad tie tied. He ran a chain through the window, through the living room, into the back bathroom, tied it to a railroad tie and pulled it through the whole house because I got him kicked off of section eight. Wow. Don't do anyway. Back to management. Um, set up your property's cash flow. Stick to your guns. Don't take a deal just because it's a deal. Take a deal because it is a good deal for you and for the seller. Hire, fix in your property management. If you are ultra conservative, the I think if I can sum it up in one mistake that I made, I I would look at the deal on paper and then I would shoehorn the numbers. I'd be like, well, if we just maybe we'll we'll do a little bit better on rent or maybe occupancy will be a little better than I'm expecting. I don't, to be honest, it was 20, 25 years ago. I don't remember, but I remember that I did that. I would look at the numbers and I'm like, oh, we're only a couple percent away from where this is in the buy box. How do we squeeze it in the buy box? And that led to me having a portfolio that while large did not provide cash flow or all that great of appreciation. When I cashed out, although I owned millions on paper, when I cashed out, I cashed out for like less than 200K in cash. 
by the time I was all said and done. I should have, if I would have structured stuff correctly, I went back, I I thought about this and I, I didn't think I'd ever be back in real estate, to be honest, because it was so painful. But like there were nights, I remember there was a night um, sitting in Asia uh, somewhere on a beach where I like wrote in a notebook and I went through the properties. I would have bought half as much property, but I would have been twice as profitable. I would have made the same amount of money with half the headache if I would have done it correctly. So if I could go back, direct advice to myself would be much stricter on my buy box. It's worth waiting three, four, five months to find a good deal. That does not mean you should not be putting out offers. If you're listening to this and you're like, Steve said, don't like, wait, no, no, no. Put out (laughs) offers, put out a lot of offers. I would have put out the same amount of offers. I just would have made, I would have stuck to my guns harder. I appreciate you sharing that, Steve, but I I will tell you something because I I come from, you, you do multifamily. I want to touch on something, but I, I come from the world when I started commercial real estate, I was doing office buildings. And one of the things is, is that um, obviously there was a time where office buildings were great and all that kind of stuff. And, and one of the things that I saw that I, I think that unfortunately some of the people I was associated with in the past didn't see as well or, or through the same lens was the fact that back to that buy box and, and kind of shoehorning and doing different things was I felt like they just keep being like, don't worry, it's going to work out. The building's going to come back. Office is going to do all these different things. And I ended up pivoting to more the industrial sector and, and, and understanding that and then partnering with, with the GPs and things like that and, and, and getting my getting a little more diversified. But the reason I bring that up is because you touched on something which I think our audience probably should talk a little bit more about. And this is the one thing is, what do you see are some of the mistakes that people are making the multifamily or have made? And how do you see that runway going into the future, especially with the fact that I believe that what you talked about is being done today? I'll put it in two large buckets. We can go down either path um, or we can talk about all of them. The first big mistake that I see is, uh, I call it exotic financing for lack of a better term, but it's either short-term bridge loans or think about the people that took short-term bridge loans in 2020, 2021, they would have had a decent performing asset if they would have taken long-term fixed debt. Instead, they chose to take a short-term bridge loan to maximize the return. I, I understand the thought process, but now those same people are having to sell because they can't refinance. They can't get out of the property and they're actually losing. It goes back to the Warren Buffett concept of protect against the downside at all cost and accept a moderate upside. Instead, those people polarized, I'm I'm not fully on screen, but they polarized. They're they're either going to win really big or they're going to lose. As opposed to the Warren Buffett, I'm never going to lose, but I'm going to win moderately 99% of the time. I see people did that a lot with bridge financing. The other thing that I see is I see people fudge numbers all the time. Um, when we do underwriting, I'm not the the head underwriter. My my skill set is sales marketing, um, but I sit in on our underwriting calls um, and I look over our underwriting. What we see out in the world a lot is people that are maybe just getting started and they get in the underwriting and they do what I did back in 2002 and they fudge the numbers just a little bit. They look at their occupancy numbers or they look at their CapEx. And they're like, you know, we can, we can shave a little bit off. We just won't, we won't do quite as nice countertops or we'll, you know, maybe occupancy. We're just going to make sure that we run really good specials and that we get them filled. There was a, there was one person I saw took a, a multi-unit in Dallas. I think it was Dallas, Dallas or Houston. And they being new to the space over renovated, they were moving walls in apartments They were doing, it was a solid C-class property that would have performed really well with just some paint and some countertops. But instead they went in and they said, we're going to make it a B-class property. Well, they went way over budget. They didn't understand their contracting costs. They didn't understand cost of materials going up. They didn't understand that contractors' bids rarely stay where contractors bid at. And they're now facing bankruptcy. They've done two capital calls. They haven't been able to raise the money. um, And that one's going to be kind of tough. So that's it. That's like the two buckets. One is fudging the numbers. Instead, just go partner. 
on a GP deal and look over their shoulder. Make sure that they've got a really good track record and sit in on their underwriting calls and stick to your guns on underwriting. It is better to over be over conservative and shop for deals. Make a million offers before you get one, but get one that you know is going to knock it out of the park than something that is going to be mediocre because the pain of having to go back to your investors, we knock on wood, we've never had to do it at home invest. We've never had a capital call. The pain of doing that, the pain of me going through what I went through in 2004 and 2005 made it so I I didn't think I was ever going to touch real estate again. When I started holding real estate events, I had several people ask, ask, offer to bring me in the GP. And I said no, because I didn't want the pain. Nate finally convinced me otherwise. Um, I got involved in two projects before working with Nate that eased me into it. But the that pain, if you have to go back and do a capital call or heaven forbid you lose the project... And like, you have to file bankruptcy. That is a huge amount of pain. Nothing is worth that. Like, take care of your investors. It's pain even, I mean, it's pain on you. It's pain on your investors. It's pain on everybody. And it creates so much emotion and also pause for what's next, right? And so that's always a big thing that we want to make sure that we're taking into consideration anytime you do it. Um, as, I'm going to kind of go back even to it. So you focused on even when you started is now you did a lot of events. You went from real estate, got out of real estate to events, but now you're back in real estate and doing events. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the events that you do in the real estate world? Sure. So we do a couple different ones. Um, I'll, I'll give you the high level buckets. The, the first one is just financial education training. So we do this both for youth um, to schools and we do this to public interest groups. Um, I'll go speak at a nonprofit uh, that's doing a fundraiser, and I'll just give a little talk about financial stability in the world. Um, it does lean more towards the conservative side. I'm not a big Trump fan by any means, but I am a conservative. Um, I believe that conservative money, I believe that the government shouldn't be telling us what we should do with our money. I believe in building a solid foundation for your family. That's if you have a solid structure for your family, whether it's just you, it's you and a significant other, or there are kids involved, you are going to go a lot further, a lot faster. We are facing a problem with retirement funds in this country um, that we're going to see 15, 20 years from now when people are not able to retire. And we're also seeing AI come in and love it or hate it. AI is here to stay and it's going to take some jobs. Um, we're going to lose, especially some of the lower income jobs. So how do you plan for retirement successfully? How do you have a budget, right? Um, really interesting data point on this. And then I'll come back to the, the speaking. Um, Americans had the least ever in savings right before COVID. During COVID, we hit the highest number we had ever seen since the 1940s or 50s. And then last fall, we were back down to the lowest amount ever in savings. That is, I, you can talk about inflation, you can talk about whatever you want. Americans live a life where if we want something, we go buy it and not having that control. I just, I gave a talk this morning actually, um, on budget and people were like, I don't have money. I don't have money for that. And I was like, who had money to go out to eat in the last week and spend a hundred bucks on a meal? 80% of the room raises their hand. I'm like, what if you would have gone to a meal that was half as expensive and put 50 bucks away for the month? You did that four times. You got $200. You do that. And you invest in stuff like it, it's a mindset switch. It is not a money switch. And I, I'm real talk. I understand inflation is real. We all have plenty of expendable income. You can you can go rent rent a smaller place. You can go eat rice and beans, or you can figure out how to make more money, which is make the pie bigger, which is my choice. But either one of those are possible. Um, so that's the financial piece. We teach that both to adults and kids. Um, the back end of that is I point to real estate. Hey, if you can get in, whether you're doing single family fix and flips, or you buy, if you buy one rental property, when you are 40 years old, you will take 10 years at least off of your retirement curve. So instead of retiring at 65 to 70, you'll retire at 55 to 60. One rental property that, that performs well. And that is pretty much available to anybody. So that's, that's the educational bucket. Um, the three day and the one day event that we do at home invest are specifically geared towards investors. So we run a lot of Facebook ads and we bring people in saying, we're going to teach you how to do single family and maximize value. 
This applies to landlords or people who want to be landlords. Then we show them that they can make the same amount of money by investing with us in a passive deal. That leads, I would say, 20 to 30% of the people book a call with us. And they don't usually invest right away. They get some information. That's where the third bucket of events comes in, which is nurturing and education on multifamily real estate. So we have a weekly live show we do called the Opportunity Zone, where we just talk about the biggest, it's like sports center, but for real estate. So we break down and we banter and we talk about like what's going on in the real estate world. And then we show them an investment. We also do deal launches and we also do just educational, like where's the world, we call them state of the unions. Where's the world at right now when it comes to real estate? What do you need to know? How do you see around the corner? All of those are nurture style events. It's kind of like what this podcast is to your audience. Only we do it. We do, we try to do three nurture events a week. So the opportunity zone is always one. We put out a podcast and then we usually do one other, like either a Facebook live or a pop-up or a webinar to our list where we just talk about real estate and we don't hard pitch anything. We do mention our deal, but we don't hard pitch it. Um, that usually leads. So the big events where we spend all the ad spend, right? hundred to 200 K a month in ad spend fill our three day and our one day. Then from there, they stay in our circle, they get nurtured and they eventually invest. So that's, that's all the events in a nutshell. Well, I just have to say, I obviously love to pick your brain about the events and it's definitely something that will continue to be one of the topics I love to um, learn from you and continue to just um, create different things that we can continue to inspire and educate people. So this is going to lead me right into um, the wonderful question I'd like to ask every single one of our cast, our guests is um, our company's motto is faith, family, and giving. Out of these three things, they resonate um, really strongly within our team. Can you elaborate on how one of these are an impact in your life? Sure. Um, I love that, by the way. So we, um, one of the, one of our core tenets is um, faith over fear. And fear never goes away, right? Like no matter how, how big, the, the bigger the deals get, there's obviously more fear. Like I, I always say, do you think Elon Musk ever wakes up and is like, yeah, everything's great? No. He lives, I mean, he has fear haunting him. And he said, he said that he said, I have fear haunting me every day of my life. A third of the world's economies depend on Elon Musk. Think about that. Like, anyway, back to your question. Um, faith definitely. Um, and giving was one of them, right? So I would say those two. So the first one is faith. Um, going back to how did I think I could be on stage holding events? I felt like it was what I was called to do. When I looked at, I, I kept like, I use these cheap composition notebooks, right? For everything. I have three of them on my desk. Um, when I was, had my time off after selling real estate, one of the things that I said I wanted to do was speak on stages. I wanted to inspire people. I wanted to motivate people. Um, when Tony Robbins asked, what does the next 10 years of your life look like? That was the first thing that came to mind. A few other things were in there, own a restaurant, blah, blah, blah. So which one of these makes me the most excited? Which one of these also makes me the most scared? Which one do you, I think I'm going to have the hardest time doing? And it was the events, but I had faith that I could do it. So that's, and it, it wasn't faith in me. Yes, I knew I would show up and do the work, but it was also faith. Like I wasn't a super strong Christian then. Um, I've come a lot further in my Christian journey since then. And now I would say that I'm, I'm much further, like much stronger Christian. But at the time I said like, God, if this is what you want, and like, I feel like that's what you want out of my life, then I'm going to do it. And I'm going to trust that you're going to show me the next step. And one of the things that stops a lot of people is they don't see the entire path to the top of the mountain. You guys hike all the time. I hike a lot. When you're starting at that trailhead, do you know what's around the next corner? Nope. Not at all. But you can see the mountaintop. And when you get halfway, your husband tells you, you're you're right there. It's almost there. And I'm like, oh, good God, I still got half the thing to go. And he's like, you're fine. You're fine. We're almost there. Brittany, everybody needs that person. Otherwise, you would never reach the top. Very true. Very true. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, it could be your husband. It could be a coach or a mentor. Um, we haven't gone down that route at all. But there's, we all need cheerleaders. Because we all have days where we're like, man, I'm not there yet. What do you mean? Why isn't it around this bend? And then you go around the bend and you're like, it's not here. And you throw a tantrum, right? Like I, I still have a tantrum now and then. 
I still have days where things aren't right. Um, so I get it totally. So that I would say the faith piece. Um, I would also say the giving piece, like we're not here just to make money. I know, I know that uh, there's some people out there that, you know, like if you're having a hard time meeting your basic needs, then it's a challenge. But if you go give and you are in a spirit of giving, your entire life will up level because you will believe in humanity. You will believe in faith. You'll believe in hope. You'll believe in kindness. You'll see the best in people instead of seeing the worst. And I think that that really comes back to giving. Um, I was talking about this with budgeting earlier. No matter where you're at, everybody should be able to give 10%. It doesn't have, I believe in giving it to the church. Um, the Bible's pretty clear on tithing. If you're not a Christian or if that's not your thing, you can still give 10% to a charity that you believe in and it will change your wiring, which will allow you to become more profitable overall. I could have said it better myself, my guy. I, I actually was sitting here I'm like, oh my gosh, for as many times as we've done podcasts and talked about this question, the way you put it together, I'm like, okay, I don't know if I've seen it put that way. So I appreciate that. See, for me, I, I guess as we wind down the show, there, there, I always kind of want to make sure that I leave the space for one thing. And, and so there, this is a two, uh, so I'm going to ask two final questions, I guess. The first one being, if there's a piece of advice that, that or something that you can share that we did not touch on there in the show thus far, what would that be for our audience? I know we talked about like what advice would I give myself if I went back in time, but it, it goes to now. You don't have to do everything in your business. Maybe you do at the very beginning when you're getting started, but as soon as you can, find a partner. I mean, Brittany and Angel, I'm sure you guys manage different things because you have different strengths. Nate, Nate does all the spreadsheets. He does all the real estate, like nitty gritty. I just get to go out and have fun and talk to people and inspire people. And yes, there is work to events. Like the event is only 10% of it, but I really enjoy what I do, which means that I do it with joy and gladness. And I'm excited about it. If you're in real estate because you enjoy it, do the pieces that you enjoy and outsource the pieces that you don't or find a partner. If you give up 20, 30, 40% of your business to partner with somebody who has your weaknesses, you will go further faster and you will end up with a larger pie than if you try to do everything yourself. Man, I, you know, it's funny you say it that way because I, I think that one of the things that, and I always talk about having the abundance mindset versus scarcity mindset. And a, and a lot of times the people that do have that scarcity mindset, it's all like, protect it's mine it's all and it's like and actually someone just brought it up in a meeting that i had this week where they officially uh, uh decided a, a partner on a, on a on a strategy and i thought it was pretty beautiful and it was like the thing that they mentioned that i liked was the fact that they're like hey i rather own one he was like i rather own one percent of facebook than a hundred percent of my space and i was like <laughs> so it's kind of one of those moments where it's like you're right man I, and i think that our audience definitely needs to take that to heart because i would say that partnerships and abundance mindset will lead you a lot further. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Steve, obviously, I know that I can keep you here all day because uh, you're actually one of my favorite people. And for anybody who doesn't know Steve in our audience, I just want to make sure you guys know something. He throws events, but the man's got some of the flyest sports coats I've ever seen. <laughs> okay? This is good too that we get that out there. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. I will uh, now. Now the game's on. I'll have to show up next time wearing one of them. <laughs> oh man, don't let me down, baby. Don't let me down. But but if, Steve, if someone wants to find you or really have an opportunity to, because you're truly inspiring. You're someone that I I'm looking forward to growing with and, and getting to know even more so on a deeper level. Um, how would they be able to do that? Sure. Uh, Steve S T E V E dot coffee C O F F E E. Um, what you'll find there, there are three links. One uh, is to book a call on my calendar. One is to grab, we have a lead magnet. Um, it's called the five landmines of passive real estate investing, um, it's an educational product. And the last one is if you'd like to have me speak, whether it's a podcast like this or come to a live event, something like that, um, we can have a meeting around what speaking looks like, but you can connect with me there. That's steve.coffee. Man, and by the way, when you said that, you actually might you kind of uh, hit a little new note in my head that I got to look into uh, how to make sure I get more coffee with people. So thanks for saying that, Steve. Coffee. Um, but but audience, I just want to say, uh, and everyone, and Steve, more importantly, thank you. I want to say thanks for everybody for joining us again on another episode of Taking a Leap in a Commercial uh, Real Estate Podcast. And more importantly, like I always like to sign off, I want to make sure that as much as possible, 
as you guys are doing things out there, make sure that you're looking at building relationships, not by going wide, by going deep, because you're going to find that you're going to get some great partnerships, great people in your life, and you're really going to be able to go somewhere with that. So just keep focusing on those relationships. So we're going to sign off. And again, thank you, Steve. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for joining us on the Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to support us by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And remember, the views and content shared on this podcast do not reflect that of Keystone Private Capital. Thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode.